Hi, I'm Christian Brindle, and welcome to the Everything Medicare Podcast. What's up, everything, Medicare, Podcast Nation? This is Christian Brindle. Wherever you are and however you might be listening, I hope this video, podcast, audio, however you might be listening, finds you doing well. Every single week, we bring you three podcast episodes where we discuss your Medicare, your Medicaid, your Social Security, and everything that has to do with that golden age called retirement. And I have a really, really special guest with me today. Um, I've been really looking forward to this one. You may know him if you've been listening to us for some time. Um, we did some work together on the podcast back during the enrollment period. And um, I have Randy W. Hall, the Mr. Nice Guy Medicare advisor here on the show with me. Randy, thank you for taking some time out of your day. C to the B. The pleasure is all on this side of the monitor, man. Finally, <laughs> finally glad to be here talking some Medicare and some crazy stories with you. Hopefully, we can uh, entertain you as well as educate you. Absolutely. I mean, that's, that's kind of the goal here, right? Um, well, Randy, you've been, you've been someone that's been, you know, working with people in Medicare a while. You know, you, you're experienced. You've helped a lot of people. Before we kind of get into this a little bit, talk about your history, how you got into the business, and kind of what you're doing now. Uh, I'll give you the Cliff's Notes version. But uh, the main thing was I moved here from uh, Detroit, Michigan, where I hail from um, 13 years ago, Super Bowl Sunday, 13 years ago. And I never had been in the insurance business, knew nothing about it. I actually came from advertising in Detroit. And my sister got me a job as, uh, at, through Kelly Services, where she worked at the time. She got me a job in, in the Medicare side of Genworth Financial which doesn't exist anymore. Right, right. But back then it did. They got bought by Aetna, in case anybody out there needs some trivia. But <laughs> uh, I started working for them, and I became an agent recruiter. So what I would do is I would recruit agents to sell Genworth Financial's Medicare supplement products in Continental Life. Uh, if, you, if you remember them, them out there, agents, Genworth bought Continental Life. So I was out there recruiting agents to sell those supplements throughout the United States. So I learned all about Medicare. I learned all about the industry. I did that for two and a half years. And then uh, one day we were making too much money because we got paid commissions on our agents and we got a salary. Well, our boss's boss got the brilliant idea to lay us all off and then rehire us at straight salary to save the department some money because Genworth, the parent company was bleeding money. If you, if you remember that. <laughs> so they laid me off. Well, one thing they didn't count on was me not taking my job back. So what they had done is they made me get my license while I worked there. And me and my wife talked about it and she's like, look, you're going to get unemployment because they laid you off. You didn't, you didn't get fired. You got laid off. So I was able to get unemployment. So all that to say is she's like, I can float us for a while while you build your business. And that's what I did almost 10 years ago to the day. Uh, it was January 14th, 2010 was when I officially got laid off and went out on my own. So I had some good mentors, guys I had recruited. And the main thing, this one guy, his name's Don Oliver. I'll give him a shout out in Evansville, Indiana. Great guy. He said to me, he said, Randy, no matter what you do, get to 500 clients as quickly as you can. Because if you get 500 clients, as you know, Christian, this is a residual based business. So if you get 500 clients, you can pretty well stay in business without too much of a problem unless you're reckless or stupid with your money. So I got the 500 clients within two years. So in two years, I had those 500 clients. That's great. Yeah, he says the reason you do that is so you can, you know, you could start to relax a little bit and enjoy life. So you you live in Utah now, 
mm-hmm. which I think is the land of multi-level marketing. That's how I oh, think of Utah. It's, it's the capital. So what, what these multi-level marketers talk about doing is what we do. Like we have true residual income, if you think about it, because what senior citizens is going to go without health insurance? Mm-hmm. So I got those 500 clients. And from those 500 clients, I've been able to work a lot less hard and enjoy my life a lot more because I focus on retention. The way we lose clients most of the time is by death unless we just ignore them. So if you keep up with your clients and do the right things for them, number one, they'll refer you to their friends and family. Number two, they'll stay your clients. Like even if the plan is terrible, because that happens, you'll put people on a plan and they'll have a, a bad experience. Well, if they don't know you or trust you, they'll just go find a new agent or something or get talked into something, which, I mean, it happens once in a while. But if you try to help them and you, and you work with them and you call them every year, like I know you do, and I do too, they know that you care and they'll, they'll trust you to, to find them something better a lot of times. So that, that was the secret for me. Now I'm 10 years in and I probably have a thousand clients now, give or take. Um, so I got 500 in two years, and I got another 500 basically since then. But people die, they drop off. Mm-hmm. So what I always try to do is at least replace the ones I lose. If I keep 1,000 clients and I keep 1,000 clients happy, I don't have to spend money on advertising unless I want to. And that's why I sponsored your fine podcast, because I wanted to. Um, but yeah, that, that was really it. Um, I knew nothing about Medicare. I kind of lucked into it before I worked in this industry. The most I ever made in my career was $30,000 a year. Now I make that on January 1st when I wake up. (laughs) Right. (laughs) I'm not trying to brag. I'm just, I'm just being honest. So, right. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I, I can identify before I started doing this, before I started work came in and, you know, my dad brought me in and had me work with him. I was working at an assisted living facility making oh, yeah. dollars an hour, you know, so I was probably making even less than that um, Jesus. At the time. And that's hard work too. Definitely. Definitely. Um, but yeah, well, I know, I know um, one thing that we were going to talk about today was just kind of a change of tune, a change of tone a little bit was just kind of some crazy stories that, okay, both of us are very seasoned um, insurance professionals. We've probably seen a lot in our time. Oh, yeah over the, in our careers over the years. And, um, talk about an instance. This the first thing that comes to mind. What's the craziest thing you've ever seen in this business? Maybe particularly like going to the home. Have you ever seen like some kind of crazy instance going to someone's house? Oh yeah. So I deal a lot with the dual market. Okay. I used to deal a lot with the dual market and that means that you're on Medicare and Medicaid both. So um, a lot of these folks, I would say most of them are probably not even seniors because most of them are on disability and they can't work. And because they can't work, they don't have, that's how they qualify for Medicaid. So when you go into a lot of these people's homes, I mean, it is a horror show. And I'm not trying to be mean, but I mean, I think that's how a lot of agents get scared off. Mm -hmm. They think that's how it is all the time and it's not. But the craziest thing I ever saw was uh, about a year ago, I got sent, uh, Anthem owns a company out here called Amerigroup. And I got a home appointment through Amerigroup. So I went to this guy's house in the middle of nowhere, BFE. And I get there and I can't find the guy anywhere. Like he's not around. I'm like knocking on his door. I mean, this guy looks like he's running a junkyard out out of his front yard. (laughs) Yeah. Then all of a sudden in the distance, I hear like this country music coming up the driveway. I'm like, holy shit. Is that him? Uh, can I swear on here? I'm sorry. I just, uh, no, no, you're good. You're good. A little here and there, but not too much. <laughs> but uh, so yeah, I'd be, I'd be lying if I, if I'd be a hypocrite, if I said none at all, I, I have been every now and then. <laughs> I'll try to tone it down. <laughs> you're good. You're good. So I hear this country music from a distance and he's rolling up the driveway in his pickup truck. I'm like, I think this is him. And his name was Homer. So Homer rolls oh. out there and goes, he's like, hey, boy, what are you doing here? I'm in Tennessee. <laughs> I'm in the hills of Tennessee. Like, if you're yeah. thinking deliverance, this is where deliverance could happen. <laughs> so 
without the banjo music, Homer's like, hey, boy, what are you, what are you doing here? And I'm like, well, I, I had a preset appointment, um, Mr. Pierce, um, and I'm here to see you. Um, so I'm going to show you this dual plan uh, through Amerigroup. And he's like, well, come, by, come on over then. So I come on over, and he, he puts down the back of his pickup truck. And I'll, I am not lying, man. A severed freaking deer head just sitting oh, there. Oh, he's like, oh. you, mind, you mind if we do it here? And I'm like, okay. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I usually start with what kind of what insurance do you have now? Because Mr. Nice Guy Medicare Advisor, like my whole racket is – I don't make a situation worse. If you've already right. got a good situation, I'm not going to screw you up. That is the last, it causes more problems and stress I don't need. That we right. don't get paid enough for that. So I always start with what what do you have now? And old oh boy, he pulls out this United Healthcare dual card. And I'm like, and in my state at at, at that time they were better. I mean, I'm just frankly they yeah. were better. The, the product now, is a better product. You could uh, you could uh, argue it a little bit more, but I'm like Homer. Uh, I'm just gonna tell you straight. Do you like your insurance? And he's like, Yeah, I, I like it, man. I'm like, Why would you set an appointment? Because you got the best insurance possible. Like, you want to talk about the golden ticket? This is it. He's he had the golden ticket already. Mm -hmm. I'm like. You don't want to step over a, a ten dollar bill to get to it. You don't want to step over a twenty dollar bill. I'm sorry, I'm saying it backwards. You want to step over a twenty dollar bill to get to a ten dollar bill, do you? you? You don't do that, do you? He's like, no. I'm like, you want to keep this, Homer? And I got the hell out of there. <laughs> yeah. Hey, well, that's that's a good agent in my book. <laughs> yeah. Because because a lot of agents out there would just be like. They come in, they look at it, they come to the same conclusion as you, and they'd be like, "Oh, Homer, your product sucks. It's time to repeal oh, that. Re 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 that and replace." Now. Yeah. Sorry, I mean. No, no, no. You're fine. You're fine. Um, but no, I'm. I I commend you for doing the right thing. You know, and just assessing the situation and getting out of there. But yeah, I as I remember, I got a crazy one for you. So. Oh, dude, hit me. So I I, re I remember. In my first two years in the business, um, I was very, very young. I must have been 22 at this time or something like that. Greater than grass. Yes. Yes. Um, blank slate, if you will. And <laughs> nice. So we got, we, we, bought a, we bought a lead order at the time. And mm -hmm. um, I don't even, I couldn't even remember what lead company it was through. But so I, I came into the business with a very good friend of mine. You mentioned um, multi-level marketing earlier. Believe uh -huh. when we were when we were just kids, we were in a multi-level marketing business together. That's how I met the guy, and then he came into the business with me. He's still with us today. He's in the office over from me. But anyway, um, we bought this lead order, and I went out on it myself. Um, and there were times we would go out together when we were first getting started. You know, just from like a, a you know a comfort perspective because we were so young. And so sure. experienced didn't have backup like that. Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, I get to this guy's house and I go knock on the door. Nobody comes to the door, but the garage door is open. So I ring the doorbell a couple of times, make an appointment with this guy. Um, and so I call the phone number and he's, and when I talked to him on the phone, he sound, didn't sound quite right. Uh huh. Which, <laughs> a little screw, screw might be loose. Yeah. Something along those lines. Hey, don't and, go to the top floor. So, so I, I call, this is something out of like a horror movie or something. I kid you not. Um, I couldn't make this up if I tried. So I call him and he go, he answers the phone and he says, oh, the garage door is open. Come through the garage. I said, okay. So I'm walking through the garage. He's like, don't go through the, the, first, the, the door though that goes into the house. To your left, there's a stairway that goes down into the cellar. Whoa. Um, and so I go, I go in. Sure enough, there's this like, Silence of the Lambs like stairway. Holy hell! To the cellar, I'm like, huh? like, <laughs> and I'm like, all right. So I just walk down the stairs, and the walls were made of concrete. They looked like they were soundproofed. Um, so I get down there, and 
there's there's like it's almost like a very large area i should say um it's like a big basement open area yes yes but um there was nobody down there but him and he's in this other room off to the side and it's like it's, it probably was like the size of a closet maybe even an elevator room not very big and he's sitting in a rolly chair like this one i'm in right now and he goes come here come here i'm like I'm, and i'm at this point I'm, I'm i'm a little freaked out so i'm just because of the situation and the guy's really big the guy's like probably six five if i had to guess probably 300 pounds oh big so boy i'm not a big i'm not a huge dude i'm probably five eight maybe maybe a buck 50. and at this point even lighter than that um and so I'm at the first thing that goes in my head is like, if this guy, like, if all of my, if all of my um, inside voices are correct, you know, you ever, your, 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 your inside head is telling you something and get away from something. It's usually probably true. It's a good instinct. Yeah. yeah. And so. You know, <laughs> Fight I, or flight. I, I, I start thinking to myself, if this guy got a hold of me or something like that, I, I, I'd never get away from him. You know, I almost felt like I was being kidnapped or something. I felt like I was a little kid all over again. Not that I was ever kidnapped, but you got to get my point. Um, I get what you're saying. <laughs> so, I think you're going to be on an, an investigation discovery program. Yeah. Oh, my, my wife will be watching. She loves watching those. But um, <laughs> <laughs> and um, so I go, I walk very tentatively into his office and I sit down. And like I said, the, his office was probably the size of an elevator room. It was not huge. I walk in. There's nobody else down there. He closes the door, which I'm like, why are you closing the door? And I'm like, there's no one else down here. And we're very close together, very small encounters. I, I talked to him for probably 10 minutes and there was something off about this guy. Something was not right about this dude. So I made it sound like my phone was going off. I looked at my phone. I was like, oh, I'm sorry. I have to go. I'm sorry. I missed. I, I forgot I had a meeting. I forgot I had this. I forgot I had that. And he's like, oh, are you sure? Are you sure? And I just boot, bolted out of there like a bat out of hell. <laughs> my God. I, so as a postscript um did you like watch the news a week or two later and this guy this guy's house was on the news no as, no i mean that would have been a perfect end of the story well not not a, not like that you don't want to ever see something like that but but like no i never i never saw him on the news never heard about him again or anything like that but good lord I think I told him, I was like, I was like, yeah, your plan's the best thing for you, blah, 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 blah. I was just trying to get out of there. I was like, I did, I did not feel safe. I never felt like that on an appointment quite like that again. It was yeah, very, right. very offsetting. But it was like, my wife, my wife remembers that story because she watches all those investigation discovery, you know, shows and everything like that. And she's like, she's, she's like, I wonder what would have happened if you kept the appointment. I'm like, I probably would be like, you know, in a hole somewhere you know, uh, silence of the lamb style, you know, to put the lotions on its skin again, kind of thing. And My God. <laughs> it's great. Yeah. I've never, I mean, I've been, uh, in this over a thousand people's homes, probably, you know, 2000 or something. And I've never felt like that. I mean, I've been in, yeah. I've been in some rough areas and been in some tense scenarios. I mean, I am from Detroit, so yeah. the city, yeah. not the suburbs. So it's not like I'm uncomfortable in urban areas and stuff like that. Yeah. But I would say the most, the most uncomfortable I ever was was by about, about a year ago, not far from me, maybe 10, 15 miles from me in Columbia, Tennessee. I went to go see this lady, again, another Amerigroup appointment, mm -hmm. but we were in lock-in. Now, generally, when I go to see a person during lock-in, they, they have – some sort of SEP or they got LIS or something. Mm -hmm. So there's an opportunity for me to write them, but you never know because you, I didn't make this appointment. I just show up and whatever happens happens. So this lady, I go in there and like, I can see she's, she's a little bit special because she's got all these little knickknacks and all these collections and she's, pointing out all his different collections and stuff that she has and how much it's worth. Like it would impress me or something. Mm -hmm. She's just going on and on about what she's got and where she got this. And she's just bragging about how everybody wants what she has. And I'm like, okay, that's a little weird, but <laughs> you know, that, 
that's not like unheard of. I mean, she is on disability. So, you know, maybe sometimes you can't tell if it's a mental disability. You can't tell. Right. Because sometimes you're like, they seem able-bodied, but it's because they have a mental disability. Right. This lady was on disability, but she also didn't get any kind of LIS. She had no um, SEP that I could use. And it was like August. It was hot. And in, in Tennessee in August, it's hot. So, you know, I'm, I, I ascertained this pretty quickly, but this lady was a talker. She wouldn't shut up. I mean, <laughs> I'm, not trying, I'm not trying to be rude or mean, but she wouldn't stop. And then eventually I was like, okay, well, and, and then her husband walks in. And then her husband's like, what are y'all talking about? And he's like looking at me suspiciously. It's like, what are y'all talking about? I'm like, talking about insurance, sir. So he's like, hey, I want to show you something. So he takes me outside and he's got what looks to be like this huge garage, like, like an airplane hangar sized garage. But, you know, it's just like a door in there. There's no windows. So he takes me in there and it's, I'm telling you, from the floor to the ceiling, from one end to the next, full of crap, like <laughs> a nightmare of crap. Something you like, see on hoarders or something. Exactly. Like a horse <laughs> delight. This guy just, I mean, everything from collectibles, but it wasn't trash. It was all collectibles. I'm like, he's like, this is my treasure, sir. He, this is what I worked all my life to get. I'm like, I'm looking in one corner. I see like Bonzi from the seventies. Wow. It's like a collection of plates and platters. And like, he's like pointing stuff out to me. And he's like, I wanted to get you out here, boy. Because I wanted to make sure she wasn't sending you to kill me. I'm like, whoa. He's like, yeah. So he shows me his heart. Apparently, he had surgery. I'm like, yeah. I'm like, so you think your wife is trying to kill you? She's like, <laughs> she is trying to kill me. She did this. Oh, so my gosh. This elaborate story about how she had hired somebody to basically off this guy. And like the cops showed up and apparently they stopped it from happening. And I'm like, but I said, well, why are you here? If she's actively trying to kill you, why would you be near? He goes, but she'll find me. I'm like, she'll <laughs> find you? Boy. Uh. <laughs> and I'm like, oh my God, I gotta go. So like you, I, I come up, I'm like, well, I, I got my son. I do have three kids. I'm like, my son, I got to go get him from the daycare before it closes. Because it was, it was getting there, you know, it was getting pretty close. I'm like, you know, as I, I call him Rob. I'm like, Rob, I got to go. He's like, he's like, don't forget me here. Don't leave me, don't leave me alone with her. So like, oh I, I leave the place and like she, she's like, like right outside the door. She couldn't hear because the door was closed. She's like, what are y'all talking about? Like looking real creepy. Ugh. I'm like, oh, he was just showing me his stuff. She's like, you're going to call me in October, right? I'm like, well, you have my card. You can call me. So, yeah. <laughs> oh, gosh. Did she ever call? No, she never called, and I never called her. <laughs> but, like, the way she was standing there, man, that guy might have been right. Oh, she my Might have been trying to kill him. <laughs> That's like something out of a movie. Oh, I mean, my God. If I, if I exaggerate, it's just for entertainment purposes. Of course. But it, does, it doesn't sound good. like too much, though. So, so okay, so I, I got a weird – I get another weird one along those lines. So what, my first year in the business, we got a lead on a guy, um, my friend and I, and he ended up calling it first before I did. The lead, you know, for those of you who may know, it's just basically – in this situation, it was a mailer sent back into us, someone requesting information, you know, very common. And so basically, we call this guy and he's like, well, I work a lot and I'm really busy. Um, and so my friend was like, he's like, he's like well, we, we want to kind of accommodate to your schedule. Um, is there any time we can do this good? And he's like, well, I guess there would be one. Um, I could do midnight. <laughs> and he, my, my friend's like, my friend's like, Midnight? And he's like, what? Third shift. Third shift insurance. Yeah. And I've never done an appointment at midnight. I mean. Uh, me neither. I would be very weary to, to do an appointment at midnight. I mean, I don't know. It'd have to be some super special situation, you know, where like there was some weird 
thing going on. Anyway, we he gives a, he gives my friend his address. My friend agrees to go. Um, because we're he only wanted that sale, Christian. We're new. We're new. We don't know any better. Um, we're kids. I think he was. I, I might have been twenty one. He think he was twenty. And so, um, he gives he gives him he gives my friend his address. He types in the address, and it's literally in the mountains in the middle of nowhere. The GPS can't even pick it up. Wow. I've and, had that. Now I've had that happen. Of course. Of course. Yeah. And, and that's, that's not tremendously uncommon or anything like that, but the combination of it being midnight in the middle of nowhere, that was like some Ted Bundy like stuff. That's like a satanic ritual is going to happen. <laughs> yeah. If you're gonna be a star. Yeah. I mean, um, and, and then, so my friend comes to me, he's like, I don't feel comfortable with this. How about I give it to you and you go. I'm like, me? I'm like, I'm, I'm, you can't pass this off on me. I'm not going. It's so oh, bulletproof vest, man. And then I think, I think um, my, my friend called him, asked some questions about his address or something like that. And I think he ended up just deciding to cancel the appointment after all. So he kind of bailed us out. But um, yeah, it was that, that, that one was, it, I mean, for all we know, it was probably just a normal guy that only was available that time of day. But it was too many weird things at once. I mean, I've had them. Ha- I've had them want me to meet them like super early or super late, but never that that late. Right. That's a little, that's a little wild. Right. Right. No. But um, right. I got I got an MLMer story okay. uh, that happened maybe about two years ago. So you know how MLMers that they they teach you all the different ways to recruit, and I was yes. in an MLM called New Ways. Full disclosure: when I was your age. Yeah, the, who are now? I got into MLM called New Ways, and they were out of Provo, Utah, um, at the time. I don't know if they are now, but anyway. Um, so I was at the mall with my kid in the in the play area. I have two, actually, two of my boys. I have two boys. Um, I was in the play area, and I could see this guy. He was probably about thirty ish, kind of like looking at me, and kind of like eyeballing me. And I'm like, I don't mind that. I mean, that's fine. Um, so he kind of like sidles up to me and he is like, Hey, how are you? And all he's like trying to strike up a conversation. And I'm like, I'm, I'm good. How are you? He's like, you know, he starts talking. And I'm like, uh, he's like, so, um, do you wish you could play with your boys more like anytime you want? And I'm like, I kind of can if I want. <laughs> he's like, yeah. He's like, well, you know, how, how great would it be if you had all, you know, all the time in the world just to spend with your family? I'm like, like this would be good and so he starts going to mlm and didn't even get to what it was but i'm like so he's telling me and i'm like hey can i tell you something and he's like he's like yeah i'm like sir i work in a business for myself where i actually help people where i actually give them something they want or need and need he's like what is I'm like so I'm now I'm, I'm I'm making it seem like I'm trying to sell him. I'm like <laughs> yeah. flipped it around on him. Like, yeah. So like actually the people need what I have and they want what I have and I don't really have to talk them into too much. Not only that, I don't have to get orders or anything every month. Uh, and he's like, "Really?" I'm like, "Yeah." And as long as I keep my insurance license, I get paid every month. And he's like, what? I'm like, yeah. If I just decided one day I just don't want to do it anymore, I just want to keep my license up, I could do that. And I bet you I make a, and I'm, I guess this is kind of a douchey thing to say, not a nice guy thing to say. Mm-hmm. I, said, I said, you know what? I don't have to bother people at the mall. <laughs> I just, yeah. I just, people don't have to do anything anymore. I go, people are not going to cancel their insurance. He's like, yeah, I guess you're right. And then he kind of like, kind of like walked away and I'm like you know this is like MLM but the the best possible way right right I I was having a conversation the other day with um with David Duford and he was basically talking about how insurance has a very strong MLM format to it and a lot of a lot of MLM um uh, I guess structure as far as how the business goes. And I never really thought of it like that before. I mean, I've, I have thought about it once or twice, but I think he's very right about that. 
you know, very, very MLM ish, you know, um, a lot of people well, I mean, they, they talk about, you know, what it would be like to do this and to do that. And they do it with a wide eyed, naive wonder. And I'm like, that's exactly what I do now. Mm-hmm. I mean, I go on, vac- I go on vacations every year. I'm not in debt. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. I live in a great neighborhood. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh man. I mean, we've all had, we've all had the MLMers kind of, come after us a little bit. I remember, I got an MLM story for you. So you're familiar with Primerica, right? They have my life insurance, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh there you go. There you go. Um, so Very familiar with them. And the funny thing about Primerica is my dad actually got into the insurance business through Primerica before they were called Primerica, when they were called A.L. Williams. Um, oh, wow. He's, that's how he started in the insurance business. And then it kind of transitioned into him working with people on Medicare and, you know, working with an agency and learning how to learn in the business in the late eighties, early nineties kind of thing. And so, um, but anyway, so, you know, our family has a little bit of a history with Pride America for that reason, because he did it for a couple of years, I think in the beginning. And um, so when I first got into the business, you know, we, we got, I had somebody that was a friend of mine that just got into Pride America. And so he brought me and my friend, he knew both of us, over to, the, over to his house. And he brought his upline with him. Uh-huh. And she shows up in like pajamas. The upline did? <laughs> wow. <laughs> yep. That's, a, that's what we call a boss move. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, it was the weirdest thing because we were a year into the business. And she, based on talking to her, wasn't doing as well as we were. You know, uh, so, well, you know why? Because she keeps showing up in her PJs. Yeah, I She's think obviously not taking it seriously. I don't think my friend really realized. I don't think our friend really realized how well we were doing right off the bat. Um, but, but anyway, so we come in there, and she's kind of breaking down, you know, the commission schedules and kind of with their products and everything. And their commission was like, because of course, Primerica is very heavy life insurance company. Um, yeah. And so she, she's right. She's like, you can, she's like, this is the commission you'd make and blah, blah, blah. And me and my friend look at each other. We're like, we, our commission now on the life insurance companies we work with now is like double that. Yeah. And she had no idea. She was like, Oh really? And she, she, we just like, we weren't trying to, but we just completely took all the wind out of her sails, you know? Cause she's, I'm like, I don't think you really realize that you're kind of getting screwed, lady. <laughs> yeah. Well, see, that's what they, they, they prey on people who don't have an insurance background. Mm-hmm. So when they see, a, they don't know what's a good commission and what's a bad commission. Yeah. Like I, that was actually the first insurance uh, person I ever talked to. They, they recruited me when I was in college. And uh, I went to one of their presentations. This is I, like I'm 44 now, so this is 25 years ago. So I was nineteen twenty. That was the first insurance, like uh, my first brush with being in the insurance industry. And you know, I was—I don't know—I wasn't as motivated then as I am now, because uh, right. I, I probably would have done well with it if I was the way I am now. Then, but when you're nineteen twenty, nobody wants to go up to strangers and just hit them up. I mean, that doesn't sound like fun. Yeah. So, especially. You, and then the MLM thing, it's like family, friends, I and mean, everybody, you know. So I know what you mean. I do know what you mean. Um, so an- another quick story I got for you. And then if you have any more, I'll have you share them, and then we can kind of close this thing out. But I got one, got one more pretty good story. We don't want to give them too many, man. If you give, yeah. them, if you give them too many, they won't remember any of them. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, okay, so I was, I was in Florida. Okay. And I was living in Florida at this time. And Florida is like a completely different world than Utah. For those of you who don't know, if you've ever been to both places, they're like two different countries. <laughs> yeah, they really, I've been to both. And that's a good, that's a good summation. Yes. Yes. Um, so basically, you know, I, we were living in Tampa at the time. I had an appointment with somebody um, in, I think it was St. Petersburg across the bridge for those of you Floridians that might be listening. Um, 
And so I go to see her and I walk in and she's wearing a Beatles shirt, which is fine. I love the Beatles. Um, but she's got Beatles memorabilia all over her house. She has Beatles wallpaper on her walls. She has um, cardboard cutouts of every Beatle. Like it was like a collection that would probably be worth a ton of money for all I know. Wow. Um, and it was everywhere. It was everywhere. And um, she was talking and, and I was there to, you know, we're there to talk about Medicare. She's turning 65, of course. So I'm, you know, I kind of go into my whole presentation and kind of what, what's available, what's not available, so on and so forth. And, um, and she, she, she starts going, she's like, you know, I once tried to change my name to Ringo Starr. <laughs> just, like, just, just totally cuts me off. Said, yeah, just totally cuts me off. I'm in the middle of talking. I'm like, I'm like, so Medicare supplements do. And then she just blurts that out right, right in front of me. And I'm like, I'm like, really? And then I'm like, I'm like, I have to ask. I'm like, what happened? And she's like, well, they said that there was, um, they, they, she, I think she said something on the lines of that, you know, they wouldn't let her change it to Ringo Starr because, you know, it confused people with Ringo. It was some weird reason, like, but they, they, they denied it, apparently, she said, which I don't know if she was telling the truth or not, but she said she denied it. Um, they, they denied her request. And then she just kept steering things towards how she wants to go live with uh, Paul McCartney and like, it just was getting weird. And like a teenage, like a, like a teenager who's like obsessed with a pop right. star. Kind of thing. Right. That's exactly what it was like. And she's like, she's like, you know, every night before I go to bed, I say a prayer to John Lennon every night to make sure that his soul is happy and safe and everything. I'm like, I'm like, all right, at this point I'm getting a little weirded out. Um, and then this was the worst part. This is like, this was the, this was the very worst part. So she's like, oh, she's like, come here. I want to show you something kind of similar to what <laughs> the people did with you. So I go into her, I go into this other room and it's probably, you know, smaller room. And she has a, um, uh, what's the other Beatles name? George Harrison, George Harrison. Okay. She has like a shrine like thing. There's like a picture of them, big picture. Looked like it was like watercolor painted or something. And there are candles all around it. Oh my goodness. They weren't lit, but they were like lit recently. Like you could tell. Um, this she, is where she does, she like prays to George and yeah, like her pagan rituals or whatever. Spirit. Yeah. <laughs> That's, I mean, she's like, she's like, she's like, I just, it's, I, I, I have, I owe it to them to kind of pay them homage and kind of make sure that, I'm giving them my respects and everything like that. And I was like, uh-huh. She's like, I listened to my sweet Lord at least once a day. Yeah. Um, when we was fab, you know, would you, Christian, would you take my hand and pray with me <laughs> while we listen to what is life together? Yeah. yeah. And we can talk about your Medicare plan. Yeah, seriously. I mean, now I'm for anybody that knows me very well, I'm incredibly, resilient with weird stuff. My weird bar is pretty high. Man, I'm a weirdo myself. So I always try to see other people's weird that to kind of, yes. kind of, you know, I mean, it's interesting. Yeah. And so, you know, I, you know, I don't care what, what someone's religion is. I don't care, you know, what, where someone's from their ethnicity. I, I, I could care less, you know, um, to me, you know, people are people and, you know, I don't get much more into it than that, but the straw that That's broke the camel's right, back, it's not the Beatles. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. I, I couldn't help myself. No, no, you're fine. Um, the straw that broke the camel's back with this lady was um, she wanted me to basically, she's like, she's like, if I go with you, I'm looking for an agent that's willing to come by every week and <laughs> sing Beatles songs with me. And I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, you're shitting me, right? I'm like, you're just, are you just messing with me? And she's like, She's like, no. She's like, she's like, I don't work with anybody in my personal life unless they make that commitment right up front. She's mm. like, my, my, my handyman, every Sunday, we, he comes by and we, we sing. It's almost like we went to church, except for, you know, here. But we sing. It's billable hours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was like, she was like, you know, like a cult, like a Beatles cult, like a Beatles religion. I've never seen anything like this in my whole life. And, <laughs> and, um, 
You can't even make this up, man. I know, I know. And um, I was like, I was like, all right, first of all, I'm like, I do, I'm not going to do that. I'm like, second of all, I'm like, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm from Utah. I've had all kinds of, you know, I've, I've been pressured into reading the Book of Mormon and all kinds of stuff in Utah, as you can imagine. You know, Latter Day Saints, man. Yeah. 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 I mean, you know, got tons of clients that are Mormons. I have nothing wrong with Mormonism, but I've had all kinds of things pushed on me. I never felt pressure like this lady was putting on me. <laughs> Become part of her church. It would be a fun cult. <laughs> you, you, you know what I would do? If it, I mean, this is me thinking out in the moment. I don't know if I'd have come up with it, but if I could, if I could get to where I am right this second, I'd be like, I'll make you a deal, ma'am. I will give you my personal list of top 10 Beatles songs. Yeah. And every week you can pull it out and play this from 10 to one, however you want to do it. Yeah. And I'll give you maybe a picture of me. <laughs> pretend that's me playing yeah. and listening to these songs with you. And that's the best I can do. Yeah. And, 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 and put it on her plate. <laughs> yeah. It was, it was, it was so bizarre. I mean, I didn't really feel threatened or anything like that, but it was just bizarre. <laughs> yeah, I would say. And she, and she had a contract for me to sign that said I would come. Oh my God, a contract. A legal document. I would love to I don't see. Know if, I don't know if it was legal. It, it looked like she typed it up on, on Microsoft Word or something. So I don't know if it was a legal document, but I'm still not going to sign that. <laughs> uh, if you had and, enough money behind you to, to see if, if that would go to like the people's court or yeah, something yeah. like that, that'd just be, that would just be hilarious just to have to argue that in a public forum. <laughs> but I was like, I wonder what happened to this lady. Now I'm fascinated to know. I mean, I wonder... Because she said that she said there were two people that came by once a week and they did her a little Beatles church service kind of deal. Sure, they did. And, um, they, and but they were people that like one was her handyman, um, the other was like I want to say it was her car insurance agent, but that doesn't sound right. I'm trying to <laughs> blank on who the other person was. But <laughs> her P and C agent. Yeah, yeah. And I was yeah, like, man, auto. Only P and C agents would stoop so low. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but but it was weird. It was a weird one. I you know Lee, that's hard to top. Not that not that this is a game of one upmanship. I have not. I have a, a a rock and roll related one, but it, it won't have anything to do with uh brainwashing or mind control. <laughs> or like that. Yeah. Um, this this last year, uh this last AEP, I went to an, another uh podunk place. And I met a gentleman and I walked in and uh, I, I'd made the appointment over the phone. And, you know, a lot of times the easier the appointment is to set, you think to yourself, well, if I got an appointment that easy. You got always got to be worried. Like, are they going to just flip agents to whoever's in front of them? Because that happens. Of course. A lot of times it, if you have to work for something, that's actually to your benefit if you get it. Because if you have to work for it, like most people, they, they won't go through the, those barriers to entry. Well, this guy was the opposite. Call him up and he's like, well, can you come on over and show me what you got? Because I don't know if, if what I got's any good. You know, so anyway, I just, I went. I went on the appointment. And this guy had Elvis stuff everywhere, you know. Good old, good old Elvis right here. Yeah. I had this out to remind me. <laughs> uh, anyway, I'm like, wow, his name was Jerry. I'm like, Jerry, this, this is a lot of Elvis stuff. And his wife and his son were there. Um, so he, his wife was in a wheelchair and his son, I think, was uh, uh, disabled somehow. So anyway, he's looking after them. So he's like, yeah, when uh, Elvis was in Germany, we, I was in Germany at the same time. We were in the same platoon or whatever they call it. We were in the same place together. And this guy had pictures of him and Elvis like jamming together in Germany. Wow. So, I mean, yeah. So, like, like he was telling me all kinds of cool Elvis stories about when Elvis was a scout over there. He's like, Elvis would get in that tank. He didn't know how to drive that tank. And it was just, it was fascinating. <laughs> He's like, Elvis yeah. could drive Jeep. 
But he tried to pretend like he could drive the tank. He couldn't drive the tank. He could just handle the Jeep. Uh, you know, just telling me all this inside baseball stuff about Elvis. He's like, he had girls running in and out of there two, three <laughs> times. In. I'm like, yeah. in Germany? He's like, yeah, they didn't, you know, they, they, Elvis was a real cool guy, you know, whatever his vernacular was. He didn't say cool. Yeah. But, you know, Elvis was a great guy. He was, <laughs> he was real down to earth. Um, I could talk to him. He was from Tennessee like me. Um, so he's like, me and Elvis got on real good. And we would play the music together, you know, every week or so and just showed me like a whole photo album of him and Elvis just hanging out and playing that's together. Awesome. So, I mean, I know he was telling the truth. Yeah. So that, that's that's awesome. probably one of the coolest, coolest people I ever met. Hey, well, I love that. I love when I run into people like that. I mean, I, I, I ran into one guy and I'll, I'll tell, I'll tell this real quick story and then we'll close every, we'll close it out. But Y'all are getting your money's worth today. Yeah, yeah, just for the sake of time, everybody. Um, but so basically, um, I went to this guy's house, and he had pictures on the wall of him training, like, you know, in the gym training, martial arts training with Chuck Norris. Wow. And he's like, he's like we were buds. We, we did everything together. We trained together. And I was like, what, you're kidding me? And he's like, Pictures on the wall, and then, tell you some Bruce Lee stories. No, no, it was uh, I don't I don't think uh, I don't well, like Bruce Lee and uh, Chuck Norris. They 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 were, they were coming they were up buddies. at the same time. Oh mm-hmm. God! Oh right, right. I don't know a whole lot about Chuck Norris, and so but I I know enough to know who he is, and so um, but it was interesting. The same thing. He got out the photo album, kind of went through them and everything like that, and I was like, he's like, yeah, we trained together, and I'm like, did you ever beat him? when you sparred and he's like, he's like all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Chuck would never say that. But yeah. Yeah. Damn, I mean, it didn't happen. We, we don't want Chuck to hear this. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it's out there now. Yeah. We have nothing we can do about it. <laughs> out there. You, you didn't say the dude's name. So yeah. it's not like you put him on blast. Yeah. Well, Randy, um, talk about talk about Mr. Nice Guy Medicare Advisor. What areas do you work with people in? Where can people f- get in touch with you? If somebody listens to this and they just, you know, they want to work with you, you're like, they're like, hey, that Randy's a that Randy's a neat guy. Where can they find you? Where can they get in touch with you? Well, the the easiest way is by phone um, 615-578-5174 If you want to know about Medicare. Um, Medicare really is my niche. I mean, that's 99% of what I do. I mean, I could do some life insurance and things of that nature, but I, I really try. I learned early when I saw a lot of the people who started around the same time as me, they would try this, they would try that. I really concentrated on Medicare and I know it back to front. Now I, I still learn stuff all the time. I mean, you, when the longer you're in this industry, you're like, Oh, I didn't know that. I mean, mm-hmm. but through your podcast, I've actually, I've learned, I picked up some stuff I actually didn't know. So uh, that's well, another great, great thing about your show. But uh, I'm also on the web. If you put in MR for Mr. and then nice guy, Medicare advisor.com. That's my website. And uh, I got some um, essays and articles on there. If you want to, um, I'm kind of like a philosopher in a way. I, I read a lot. Um, so I like try to take a lot of what I read and, and kind of put it out there, not in like a crazy way, but just like life kind of life experience kind of way. Um, I have a lot of beliefs about, um, you know, the happiness and what causes happiness and what causes unhappiness. And, uh, through this job, I've had the luxury of kind of like indulging in a lot of hobbies and enjoying my life a lot while I help people and and make a good living. Like I, I like, unlike a lot of agents, I don't try to work 40, 50 hours a week when it's not AEP. When it's AEP, you know, I'll work 50, 60, 70, whatever it takes. But when it's not AEP, I, I try to enjoy my family, my life more. Uh, but I always have time. People call me. I will help them straight away. Um, and people, uh, they're like, why Mr. Nice Guy? Why'd you go with that? I'm like, well, a lot of people have a negative connotation about a nice guy. like weak-minded or whatever Mm -hmm. it it had a lot more of a better ring to it than compassionate nice guy or compassionate medicare advisor or empathetic medicare advisor yeah Uh, you know emotionally intelligent 
Medicare. I mean, that, those kind of things don't roll off the tongue the same way Mr. Nice Guy Medicare Advisor does. I, I, I love what I do. I take it seriously. Um, I don't take myself seriously, as you can probably <laughs> tell. But I take, I take Medicare and, and helping people find the best plan for them seriously. So that's my story. I'm sticking to it, Agnabbit. Great. And um, Tennessee and Kentucky still, right? Yep. Tennessee and Kentucky. Those are Perfect. my areas of uh, getting after it. I used to be in Georgia, um, but I'm not. So I don't, gotcha. don't want to tease y'all. Yeah. Hey, well, everybody, um, if you're in those areas, if you need help with your Medicare, if you know somebody in those areas that needs help with their Medicare, give Randy a call. He can help. He's a good guy. He's a good agent. And um, yeah, I mean, you're not going to find a better person in those areas. Um, Damn straight. Yeah. <laughs> Well, uh, Randy, thanks so much for taking the time. Um, really appreciate you coming on. I think it's a really good episode. Oh man, thank thank you for having me. I, I miss podcasting, so you get, you let me scratch the itch. Hey, my pleasure, my pleasure. Well, everybody, thanks so much for taking some time out of your weekend to listen to us. Um, just kind of ramble on about some stories. Hope we entertained you. And um, as always. If you're listening to us on a platform that allows you to do so, please do us a favor. Leave us a five-star review. It helps us reach more people just like you who need to hear our message. And I'll be back with you on Monday. Take care.